The following is an in-depth analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. I naturally have to cover this movie on Superhero Rewind because it's, well, a superhero movie, but I almost would rather Vince review this one just so we could have a review on our channel called Vince vs. Hulk vs. This is also one of those movies that's a little tough to fit into the in-depth analysis mold. There's a little bit of story and theme and characterization to cover here, but honestly, this project is 100% fan service. It's about putting some characters in a Marvel movie that, prior to 2009, hadn't been seen much or at all, especially Thor and Deadpool. It's about animating classic settings and iconic Marvel moments that hadn't really been animated yet. But let's not beat around the bush. It's called Hulk vs. This is, first and foremost, about action. It's not about telling stories about the Hulk or studying his character necessarily. It's about seeing him fight other really powerful characters from the Marvel Universe. And I talk a lot about intent in these reviews. I don't feel I can hold every movie to exactly the same standards because they don't all want to be the same things. When I reviewed Sin City, I thought to expect those characters to be real, to not be archetypal, would be to misunderstand the kind of story that was being told there. I believe that in entertainment, as well as in life, there is room for all things, and what's most important is that a piece knows what it is and strives to be the best of its kind. So if you're making a melodrama, push the envelopes of melodrama. So the question for something like this then is this. Is it okay to say, I just want to make a story about a couple of guys hitting each other over and over again. I just want the whole thing to be about lots of fighting. And my answer to that would be, why put that in a narrative medium? Do we really need some sort of conceit to justify watching people fight? Don't we have wrestling or MMA or video games for that? If we're going to do action in a story medium, where there are usually consequences for serious violence, why not instead write a tale that drives that action, create compelling characters in a narrative where a lot of fighting would naturally happen, and let the viewer get caught up in that world rather than a skeleton of a premise that's only there to provide a pointless context for watching people beat each other Rob. After all, comic books have always had a certain degree of the negative criticism of being just that, an excuse to see violence, and I'd be lying if I said that criticism wasn't warranted in many cases. Hulk vs. mostly does a good job with this. The fights are the selling point, but both short films contain a cohesive narrative, though one is certainly more thinly plotted than the other, and while they're very action-driven, there are some very good ideas for my overly analytical noggin to latch onto. The frustrating thing for me is, this may have been an even better project if the primary goal was on telling a great Hulk story instead of cramming as much stuff to make Marvel fans' mouths water as possible. The movie was produced and co-written by Christopher Yost and Craig Kyle, who have worked on a number of Marvel animation projects together, including writing episodes of X-Men Evolution and producing the Ultimate Avengers movies and Wolverine and the X-Men. They co-created X-23, and there's even a nod to her in one of the Weapon X flashbacks in the Hulk vs. Wolverine section of this movie. In their commentary, they make a couple of somewhat conflicting statements. In reference to the Hulk vs. Thor short, they felt the need to include an introduction to what Asgard is and most of the major players there, because Thor is less known to mainstream audiences than a lot of other Marvel superheroes. That's perhaps less true now after the Thor film and Avengers, of course. But they also say that this movie is really for the fans, and that's why they tried to get as many recognizable ideas and references in that the diehards would pick up on. And don't get me wrong, I really appreciated nods like the one to X-23 and a quick glimpse of the Simonson Thor villain Malekath during a fight with the Asgardians, and especially all the Weapon X stuff pulled right out of Winsor Smith's graphic novel. But I think the unevenness I felt from this storytelling, in both shorts, comes from too much compromising in the who did we make these for department. If these are almost exclusively for the initiated, then there's no need for all that explanation about what Asgard and Odin and the Odin sleep and the Rainbow Bridge is, nor is it necessary to provide all the Weapon X backstory, as much as I loved it visually. The problem is, by including all of that in a 35-40 to 40 minute short film that wants to spend a lot of its time choreographing fights, who characters are and what their motivations are can easily get lost in the shuffle. We can spend more time with these people if we don't have to use up much of it with recap. Because, and it's hard to know since I am familiar with these characters, I would guess the uninitiated would have a hard time seeing this movie as anything but Thor and Wolverine tussling with the Hulk. 
Again, there is some story here, but if, for example, you don't already know who Loki is, you won't know why he wants to kill his brother and rule Asgard so bad. You might not have a good sense of how vast Odin's power is and why Asgard is so vulnerable whenever he falls into the Odin sleep. You certainly won't know why, as Deadpool says, Lady Deathstrike really, really hates Wolverine. So either of these shorts, fully realized as a feature-length film, might have had the room to provide all that context for newcomers and also give us veterans a lot to smile about. As it is, I feel like only the veterans will really appreciate a lot of what's here, and so it seems strange that so much is done to clue in new viewers and overall background, but very little in telling people why a lot of the supporting characters are doing what they're doing. Hulk's name is in the title, but these stories are really about Thor and Wolverine, respectively. They're two very different short films, and the only thing that really merits their being on the same disc is they're plotted by the same writers, and they're both about somebody trying to stop the Hulk, as so many Hulk stories are. But I'm not necessarily knocking putting two loosely related shorts on one disc and together making up the running time of an animated feature. It's an inventive way to get some characters on screen Yost and Kyle really wanted to do. Personally, I would rather have seen something more more like the DC animated original shorts video with four or five 15 or 20 minute shorts where a wider variety of characters could get their own stories rather than finding ways to pack in a lot of characters in the Thor Wolverine stories. The one idea that really rings through these two movies when compared, and I think they are certainly meant to be compared even though they don't share any direct story elements, is that these are two distinctly different Hulks and each movie gives us a peek at the nature of the Hulk under very unique circumstances. These two stories don't explore Bruce Banner's personality or his psyche so much as they observe the nature of the Hulk, and by extension, the nature of what it is to be a monster, both literally and figuratively. Let's take a look at each of these shorts individually and see what they're doing with the Hulk. In the Hulk vs. Thor, Loki brings the Hulk to Asgard, and he has the Enchantress put a spell on Banner that physically separates Banner and the Hulk and allows Loki to control the Hulk. At one point, Loki starts talking directly through the Hulk as he's fighting Thor, which is fun, but also seemed to me like a silly move on Loki's part, since all he really did was give Thor more resolve now that he knows his sadistic brother is behind the plot. But Loki's plan is a pretty good one. Wait until the tail end of Odin's long winter slumber, when every enemy of Asgard has attacked and all of its soldiers are tired and unprepared, then strike with this earthly monster none of them has ever faced before. He chooses the Hulk because he's the one thing on Earth that might actually be more powerful than these Asgardian gods. But what he fails to understand is how exactly the Hulk's strength works. The angrier he becomes, the stronger he is. It doesn't occur to Loki that if he gets the Hulk too angry, Angry, he might not be able to control him anymore, and sure enough, that's exactly what happens. At first, I thought it was odd that the Hulk was so much stronger than these gods. Sure, I can see him being able to take them, but not throwing them around like ragdolls. And then, I realized the idea is that without Banner inside to temper the Hulk, he's pure rage. It makes sense that he'd be practically unstoppable at that point. This isn't the victim we're used to, the one we saw in both live-action interpretations, the Hulk who just attacks on instinct in self-defense because he's confused and wants to be left alone. The Hulk is a physical manifestation of the dark side of one man's personality. You take the man out of him, and naturally, all you get is Monster, who smashes because he wants to, who kills because he's angry, for no reason, but that that's the emotion he embodies. This idea hits home with the end of the story, where Thor convinces Loki to visit Hell and retrieve Bruce Banner, who Loki sent there when he killed him for talking too much. I really like that, by the way. Sure, there's an out here to bring Banner back to life, but at least Loki is doing what he would really do when he isn't written out of character or suddenly interrupted or something to stop him from killing what he perceives as a lowly human who is of no use to him anymore. Loki sees himself as above human beings. They don't rate at all for him. That's a lot of what separates him from Thor and drives their conflict. So it's nice seeing that on screen. But what Loki doesn't realize is that the Hulk is a part of Bruce Banner. That literally, part of Banner's soul is in Hell. If he hadn't killed Banner, even if the two were never put back together, it would have been a simple matter to just send them both back to Earth and let somebody else sort it out. The trouble is, Loki's daughter, Hela, the Keeper of Hell, now has claim to Banner's soul, and she's only got half of it so there's no way to send Hulk back to Earth. Doing this story entirely in Asgard makes such a literal interpretation of the Hulk work much better than if it were somehow done on Earth, because these ancient mythologies constantly take abstract ideas and make them literal or personify them. 
So this is a place where we can really take a look at Bruce Banner's soul, because it goes to hell and see that the Hulk isn't just a creature created by a science experiment gone wrong, but that the gamma radiation split apart his personality and only allows Banner to express certain emotions at one time. There's also that vague idea that through science, mankind might one day be as powerful as these gods, but that for now, we don't always understand what we create, and so we might be able to unleash a force that could defeat someone as powerful as Thor, but we can't control it. The biggest difficulty I have with this one is that there's no clear central character, though if I had to pick one, it would certainly be Thor. By the end of the story, Thor has to accept, as he seems to every winter, that this cycle of violence, where all of Asgard's enemies come after them once a year for months at a time during the Odin sleep, is unavoidable, and that all he can really do is protect his father's kingdom from whatever force threatens it, so that it will live on to go through another cycle. Though I do like that that unbroken cycle is similar to the Banner-Hulk relationship. Inevitably, there will be violence, and people will probably be hurt or killed, but it's the nature of Thor's world, and it's the nature of the beast, and when you try to control nature, chaos ensues. So Banner and Thor both learn they just have to do the best they can with what they have. Loki kind of has a character arc where he realizes he tried to control something he couldn't possibly understand. He says, it is possible I made a poor choice. And at the end, he has to take Banner's place in hell for a while, so he's paying for that crime. But this is clearly comic book Loki. He comes up with these great plans that are relatively well thought out, except for that one tiny oversight, always because of his own hubris that unravels the whole thing and he never learns. I have no doubt that when he gets back from hell, he'll be ready to start planning again, and and he'll probably seek revenge on Thor for leaving him down there. And Banner makes the noble sacrifice, giving up life without the Hulk and the perfect afterlife with an imaginary Betty to save Asgard. But we don't spend any time with him, and he never wrestles with any moral dilemma. He's the gallant hero through and through from the beginning. And come to think of it, it's weird that Banner is experiencing a paradise while in hell. Is that just because he doesn't have that other part of his soul? We aren't told, so it's odd. What's so bad about hell if you get to just live in a perfect world with your perfect family? The Hulk vs. Wolverine gives us the classic Hulk, tempered by Bruce Banner, and here we're in much more familiar territory with the character. The government is after the Hulk, and so is a secret project that wants to, care to take a guess, turn him into a weapon. And that secret project is none other than Weapon X itself. Department H hires Logan, this is a very early version of Logan, not too long after Weapon X, to stop the Hulk, who has only recently been sighted for the first few times, and in tracking down the Hulk, he finds Weapon X again. I like that this short isn't just about giving us that traditional Hulk to compare to the pure rage version from the Thor story, but by centering on Wolverine, it draws an intriguing parallel between these two characters and makes a great case for why comic book readers have always found Wolverine and the Hulk such a great matchup, besides just the nostalgia of that first epic slugfest which is depicted here. Logan and Banner couldn't be more dissimilar, and yet they have a surprising amount in common. Both have a fierce inner rage they struggle to control, and both have been hunted and experimented on to be turned into living weapons. They're both men trying to fight their animalistic natures and struggling against powerful forces who want to take away their humanity for their own means. But beyond that, I didn't get a lot out of the Wolverine story beyond a lot of fun but extremely brutal action sequences, mostly fights between Wolverine and mutants working for the Weapon X program. This is a somewhat uneven story that I think should have focused more on a relationship between Logan and Banner and really dealt with what makes Wolverine and the Hulk similar creatures rather than spending so much time on Weapon X. I like the idea of the professor from Weapon X trying to get his hands on the Hulk, and I'm conflicted because after X-Men Origins, it's really refreshing to see Wolverine's time in the Weapon X program done right, but again, it seems almost obsessed with getting some of these other mutants on screen that it loses sight of the themes that really make this a story worth telling. If you don't already know Deadpool, Omega Red, Sabretooth, and Lady Deathstrike, you'll be completely lost, and you might be a little lost anyway. Why does Sabretooth kill the professor and then try to make the other mutants think Wolverine did it? Why wouldn't they all want to take over the project? What was stopping any of them from killing the professor long before? for this. Deadpool's just here so fans can finally see him in an animated feature. Again, I'd rather see him get his own feature, or at least a short. Nolan North does a great job voicing him, and he sounds just like how I would have pictured it. As you'd expect, he doesn't shut up, and everyone hates him, especially the Hulk. One of the things that really sets this Hulk apart from the pure Rage Hulk is that he talks quite a bit more. He's more human compared to the other versions, so it makes a 
lot more sense. I love the nicknames he gives some of these characters as he pummels them. He calls Deathstrike Ugly Girl and Deadpool Talking Man. My favorite line in the whole thing is when Hulk screams, Hulk smash claw people! Wow, he's right. There are a lot of mutants with claw motifs. In the end, all of this fighting brings down the whole facility, bearing the other mutants. Though in an after credit scene, we see that Deadpool, at least, has survived. Of course. Wow. The two times he's been in movies and he gets his own after credit scenes. That's remarkable. The movie ends with Wolverine and the Hulk right back where they started. It's a neat bookend, but personally, I would have preferred to focus on these two and see a real resolution to that fight. Though, perhaps the idea is that Wolverine and the Hulk are so similar, both physically and emotionally, that we shouldn't see who wins in a battle between them. I enjoyed the story in 4 over Wolverine, but Wolverine absolutely has the better atmosphere and animation, in my opinion. Thor seems really anime-inspired, and I don't care for a lot of the character models. Why does Bruce Banner have these lines at the bottom of his face like he's grimacing all the time? The art direction in Wolverine seems influenced very much by the original Wolverine story in the forest sections, those penciled by Herbert Trimp, who, of course, co-created Wolverine, and then by the Weapon X graphic novel inside the facility. I love how much reverence this has for the original material, with the original Wolverine mask and those iconic panels translated directly to screen. And there's certainly a lot of reverence for what Simonson did, too, a real sense of majesty in the Thor short. Given that the point of this really is just to showcase some epic beatdowns with the Hulk, I'm impressed with what story is here and that both shorts have something to say about these comic book icons. I'm going to give Hulk Versus a 3 out of 4. Bye.